Um, so as we talked about uh, this morning, well, as we've talked about all day so far, um, the when we're writing about people with mental illness or addiction issues, you know, it's very sensitive, of course, and these are people who are struggling, um, and it's it's very delicate, and and yet, uh, and, and we are ever mindful of the fact that. Uh, not all people with mental illness are, it, that it's a spectrum, that uh, people can be in their illness, more involved in their illness at certain times than another, um, and that uh, certainly not everybody with mental illness uh, is dangerous. In fact, most people with mental illness are not dangerous. And, um, and yet, there is a segment of the population, there are people who are very involved in their illness and they suffer greatly and they, they struggle and they, their stories need to be told. So the, the question, the purpose of this panel is to talk about how do we tell the edgiest stories of uh, mental illness and addiction. And, and um, as Sheila referenced at the beginning of our talk today, you know, uh, you, history is replete with uh, examples of journalists who have um, tried to chronicle the stories and the struggles of people with mental, mental illness and of course Nellie Bly uh, who sneakily uh, you know went undercover I don't think we would do that story in that way today um, but nonetheless back in the 1880s she was calling attention to these horrific conditions in psychiatric hospitals and her stories really moved the needle uh, as Sheila noted you know they led to great reforms you know more hospital staff better training, et cetera. Um, and then um, in the 1940s, Albert Deutsch uh, wrote this book, Shame of the States, that really went into all over the country. He, he traveled down south and out west and to the Midwest and showed that this uh, problem stretched across the country. And again, his work you know, really led to um, great reform. And, and was really the germ of Harry Truman's uh, legislation, proposed legislation on reforming the Mental Health Act, which led to um, the system that we have today. And I say system kind of in quotes because there's still, it's not really a system. Um, anyway, and, and, um, and then the great Cliff Levy back in 2002 wrote what I consider to be you know, one of the best stories, best series of all time, and that was on Broken Homes, where he really went into the, um, the system here in New York and found all manner of abuses. Um, and I remember reading that story, those stories, and just being so disturbed by them and so, so uh, also um, really, like excited about following in his footprints. Like I wanted to see, is that going on where I live? And so I took a little stab at it myself and I did stories in our newspaper in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 2006 and nine and 11 and I just kept writing about it and kept going. So, um, so these, um, journalism, you know, is a, the, a great way to obviously to incite uh, change to um, shake up the population and get people to call their legislators and to get get laws changed um, and so we're really lucky today to have these guys here these people I should say um, so we have Kit Seeley from the New York Times and uh, Kit has written a great deal about um, the well and recently about the opioid addiction uh, problem uh, it, uh, her story, was it last year, uh, on Patrick Griffin and the situation in New Hampshire uh, was uh, just beautifully told and uh, she's written about what it's like for people to disclose their addictions and to be, um, uh, to have that chronicled and for all the world to see. And we're going to show a little clip of that in a minute. Then we've got Mark Olson and Mark is an epidemiologist, a psychiatrist at the medical college here. Um, he is, uh, um, well, one of the most amazing facts. He's written 400 uh, papers, is that right? And um, so that he is prolific and, um, and uh, is an authority on 
keeping uh, how, how journalists can write responsibly about uh, drug use and abuse. Um, and then we have Tom Jennings, great Tom Jennings, who is a, a journalist extraordinaire, frontline producer, two-time George Polk Award winner, um, and, and an all-around wonderful guy, uh, an excellent journalist. And then to his right is Joaquin Sapien, who is uh, uh, with ProPublica, and uh, together those two have uh, followed up on Cliff, Cliff Levy's excellent series, and they had a piece uh, in the New York Times in early December, and then they've had a follow-up in ProPublica, and their documentary uh, on Frontline will air on February 26th. So we're gonna start with Kit, um, and we are going to talk about her uh, story on uh, Patrick Griffin. These are, I apologize for the quality of these photos. This was a screen grab. So not, not Todd Heiser's beautiful photos are not reflected as uh, well as they might be. Am I talking too close in the no, microphone? No, no. I, I, I made a mistake with the chairs and kids at the wrong mic. So everybody needs to slide down one because kids at the last mic. Here. When you sit down, there's five mics. Okay. Go down this way. So oh, musical so chairs. No, well, he oh, why doesn't he just? Down there. Oh, okay. This has a green light on it. Yeah, the one next to you on the other side. I don't, we don't understand what you're saying. We're not getting this. <laughs> I, got a, I got a thing from the control room saying that people were at the wrong bikes. Okay. So you want me to hear this? You're at this mic. Okay. Got it. All right. There's no business like show business. <laughs> All right, thanks. So Kit, um, if you could please talk about just the, the challenges that, that presented. So your story so poignantly showed the agony that this family endured with Patrick's relentless, uh, well, his addiction to heroin. And, and you've written uh, for Times Insider about what that was like to write about that, but maybe you could just recap that for the crowd here today about um, what what struggles you faced as a journalist telling that story. Well, the story itself was about addiction. Um, mostly, often, we write about addiction in terms of overdose, overdoses and death. Mm -hmm. And what we wanted to do in this story was say, you know, more people who, uh, who are addicted live with addiction forever. Mm -hmm. Many more people live with addiction than die from overdoses. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to get into what that meant for the person and the family. And, um, we were able to uh, get in with his family in New Hampshire. Uh, Patrick, his sister Betsy, um, were both. That's she right well, there. Yeah. Patrick was constantly uh, using. Betsy had been using. She was in recovery. Um, uh, and there was another sister who had was not a user at all and she had bailed out of the family altogether uh, she had moved away but she had survivor's guilt she said about uh, you know having having left um, but the challenge you know there were a number of challenges one was finding the family uh, which happened because um, Dartmouth had, inter had uh, issued a report about addiction in New Hampshire mm -hmm. and why it was worse there than in other places. And uh, I had contacted them and they had talked to a number of users uh, in their report and I said, can you put me in touch with somebody who uh, you know, might be good to talk with? And um, 
they they did put me in touch with someone and he was okay not great and so I went back to them and said do you have somebody else and they gave me Patrick and uh, and you talked in the Times piece too about how his mother was really so willing to put her name well, to the story. Well, that was that was the game changer mm -hmm. in the story, because I was just going to use a little bit of Patrick's anecdotes to flesh out this report from Dartmouth, and uh, his mother Sandy had dropped him off mm -hmm. at the Burger King where we were meeting, and. I just said hello to her in passing, and I gave her my card. That was what I thought would be it. And then, like two months later, she reached out to me and told me about this just horrific episode where Patrick had overdosed four times in one afternoon, and they'd had him admitted and it was just a nightmare and she was going out of her mind i don't know if you saw the headline which was such a grabber it was one son four overdoses in six hours yeah that was a that that was workshopped that headline mm -hmm. and they, they yeah. came up with that um uh so after she got in touch with me we then were communicating for a while it still wasn't clear to me what the story was going to be mm -hmm. But after a while and after talking with Patrick and meeting them at various points, uh, it, and, and after we were able to sit in on an intervention. Well, I was just going to ask you about that. So you sat in on the intervention, you and Todd, the photographer. Yeah, and I have to just put in a plug here for Todd. If you don't know his work, you should look it up. He is uh, an extraordinary photographer. and was able to get this this amazing picture and several others and if you ever have the option of having a good photographer with you or not <laughs> take the photographer but can you tell us what that was like as a journalist to be in the room when the family is having this very emotionally this very fraught it was discussion. excruciating and i apologize for the blurry nature of these picture and you and and furthermore Patrick's father's head is cut off here, but you could see that there's a lot of emotion in this room. There's a lot of tension in that room. We just happened to be there. We were interviewing, we still didn't know what the story was at this point. We were interviewing a, a DEA agent maybe half an hour away, and, um, and Sandy texted me that, you know, they were all there and something Sandy was about was the mom. Sandy is the mother. And I read the text to Todd and he says, can we go? So I text back and say, can we come? She said, okay. Classic photographer. And it was, you know, we were half an hour away. We got there in yeah. 15 minutes. <laughs> and um, and they were so involved that we really just melted away. I had my tape recorder going. Todd was discreetly taking pictures. So, and and you felt that that was uh, an important thing to capture for you to be there to describe to the readers. Can you explain a little bit about? You know, we didn't know what we were, what was going to happen, what we would see, what would what what they would allow us to see how long they'd let us stay. Um, you know, they could have just at any point said, we're done, you guys are out of here. And, um, and they didn't. So Kit, I'm gonna transition right now to the Mandy story because, Can, yeah. Okay, I, there was just one sure. other thing that yeah. I wanted to say about the challenges of doing this story. Yeah. I think for the journalism students in here, you might find this interesting. Um, one of my biggest challenges was that Patrick was not a sympathetic figure. Mm -hmm. He was, he'd been using for, I'm forgetting, 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, overdosed at least 30 times. And, um, you know, just wasn't like, he wasn't trying. You didn't get the sense that this was somebody who was trying 
to get better and failing per se. You just got the sense he was kind of blowing it off, you know, going through life. And this really troubled me because, as many of you know, uh, you know, these addiction stories have been written over and over again. And people look at them now, they see the headline, they see what the story is about, and they don't want to read it because they know the story. They think they know the story. That, you know, here's some sad sack case and uh, it's going to have a bad ending. <laughs> and, um, you know, they just, it's hard to get people to read these stories. And so I, I really wanted people to be more sympathetic toward, I, I wanted Patrick to be a more sympathetic figure, a more compelling figure. Mm -hmm. And I was troubled by this, and I mentioned it to a friend, and she said, who's a reporter, and she said, why don't you ask him <laughs> why he's not sympathetic? And I was like, God, you know, a light bulb went on in my, it hadn't occurred to me. So I did, we were talking one afternoon and I said to him, you know, one of the problems I'm having with this story is that you're not a sympathetic figure. And I, I wrote down, I mean, I included in the story what he said. I'm gonna read it to you, it's very short. He said he knew he was not a sympathetic figure, that people may look at his life and wonder why he cannot pull himself out of this hole, especially with so much family backing. Quote, I feel like I've got nothing to offer, he said. I'm depressed all the time and I'm isolating myself. I don't really know what sober people do. His eyes welled with tears, and he scraped them hard with his open palms. Quote, I don't want people to pity me, he added, but I don't want to lie to people about my past either. I have a hard time asking for help. I always say, I got this, but I never got this. And so many people told me later, they said, you know, I didn't really think he was sympathetic until I read that <laughs> line. That, 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 that is a great piece of advice. Ask the person right. herself you know, and let them tell you. Ask them head on. That was, that was the reason, the, the lesson I came away with, you know, by addressing his lack of sympathy head on, mm -hmm. he became sympathetic. Right. And people read the story. I know it was a very, you know, well-read story. Right. So that segues us then to the Manny McGowan story, which is, uh, I don't know if you in the audience are familiar with this, but this was the woman who overdosed. And we're just going to show a little clip, like trigger warning here, people. This is a lady actually overdosing uh, in a grocery store with her toddler, crying and, and we're not going to play the whole thing but we're just going to give you a little snippet here. Oop, no we're not. It said space bar. Right? Nope. Okay. See, uh, Steven, what do I do here? Space bar? Uh, what are we looking for? Space bar? Uh, to run the YouTube. What's that? Space oh, control space bar? Oh. Okay. Yay. Thank you. Okay, and then this again. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you get the idea, and it goes on, and it goes on, and it goes on, and you're horrified. And, and of course, the first question you're asking is, why didn't that dude with the iPhone 
jump in to help her, right? But you ultimately do see somebody come by and tell her. But talk about writing about that. Okay. And, yeah. This um, this was a woman in, uh, actually, she also lived in New Hampshire. She had gone to a dollar store and passed out in the aisle of the dollar store with her daughter. And, I, I mean, I find this unwatchable. <laughs> Uh, it, it, the the daughter is tugging at her arm. She's in her little pajamas, and um, uh, and and the uh, store employees are standing around taking video of her lying on the floor. Nobody is helping the little girl. Nobody is helping Mandy. So um, what we did was we found. Uh, some other people who had also been videoed while they were while they were passed out somewhere a parking lot or you know a street somewhere and um, it took me two years to make contact well I initially made contact with with Mandy but it took me two years thank you to convince her and get her to talk to me about her experience because this was, as you can see, so completely humiliating. And she was really struggling. Um, she had, she had, she was given uh, six free months of treatment. Um, but then when she left that treatment place, she had, she'd uh, been drinking one night. She never used drugs again, but she was drinking one night, violated, violated her parole, got sent into jail, uh, was out in a, a group home, was raped. Uh, she just had a series of wretched things happen to her. Um, but in the course of that two years, we found some other people who also had been videotaped, and we decided to do a story on what it was like to try to come back after you've been just humiliated in front of the entire world. And the problem with these videos is, you know, they're up online, they go viral, and then everybody in the world comments on what a loser you are and you should be dead. And why is, you know, why is anybody bothering uh, w with you? And just the comments are the most vicious, uh, often pornographic for women, um, sadistic, just the worst kind of stuff you can imagine. So part of the problem, part of the challenge here in talking with these people is getting them to expose themselves all over again. And after they've lived through the, you know, having been the target of comments like this, how do you persuade them to consider? And not just how do you persuade them, but should we persuade them? And why do we do that? So why do we write about these, the, the people on the extreme end of the spectrum who are very ill and who, who have been so greatly traumatized how do we do that without adding to their injury? Right, right. And, and I think this, in a way, answers the question about one of the questions raised by Patrick's story about um, getting people to see, see these people as real people struggling with real problems. So in, in Mandy's case, uh, you know, I had a million questions. Would she keep our dates? Would she relapse? Would she kill herself? Which I, she was contemplating several times. In the course of your reporting, had she said that, that she had felt suicidal? Yeah. And, and so that, you were not sleeping very well at night while you were working on right. that story? Right. Neither was she. Yeah. Um, so in the end, but my biggest fear in the end was going to be the blowback online 
was she, you know, were we, was this double jeopardy for her? Where were we, go where were we going to make her twice a victim? That was my real concern. And, you know, I talked to her at length about it, trying to prepare her and saying, you know, you're sure you want to go through with this. And she did because, and this just was, you know, remarkable strength within herself, but she was really doing the hard work of trying to stay clean, um, help other people. She was, uh, had become sort of a leader in her group home. She was doing, you know, she had full days of counseling and um, uh, meetings and uh, all kinds of activities. And then she would use her lunch hour to go out on Methadone Mile in Boston, which is where all the users hang out and there are you know, hundreds of needles all over the streets. And she would go out at her lunch hour every day and pick up needles. No, put on so gloves. Let me make sure I'm understanding. So your incentive in telling her story and helping her tell her story was so that people could, would look at people in her her and people like her as human beings. And and so even though the stakes were very high th and the degree of difficulty like through the roof, that was that that was is worth it. Well, n not only did I think so, she thought so she came to the conclusion that people, she wanted to show people how hard she was working. And, um, you know, what, what really astonished me in the end was that virtually every comment on the story was supportive. Wow, that's wonderful. Sympathetic, yeah. it was caring, and I think, and, and that was also true in Patrick's case, because we had warned that family, you know, be prepared for people to say that you don't deserve to live. So what I think is the difference, and this is sort of my, my takeaway from both, is that readers have been paying attention to these stories. You know, we think people are sick of them by now, and they probably are in some ways, but I think the message is starting to penetrate to people that this is a real problem, that people don't have control over. And if you're giving them, if you're giving them the chance to have their, their voice be heard. That's exactly right. And so now, people were rooting for Mandy and these other women who had been videotaped at the worst moment of their lives. And, and the other part of that is that she owned what she did. Yeah. She was remorseful. Okay. So I'm thank done. You. Yeah. Okay. Right, thank you so much. So thank that, you. that actually is a perfect segue to talk about uh, Tom and Joaquin's uh, stories and piece. Uh, and I'm just going to show you a little clip of, if I can figure this out. Dun, 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 dun. Nope. Yep. Oh, there we go. Okay. So we're going to see a uh, space bar. Okay. You, ready, you ready to show it? Yep. So this is this is the. Um, nope. Nope. Go back this way. Ready? Okay. This is why I was. Yep. Turn it up. Only 764 people have been moved out of the building. Turn it up. More than 4,000 are eligible. Supported housing is premised on residents' wishes. 
Those who do transition out Sorry, of these can we stop? Sure? Yeah. Enough support. It's not really worth playing if you can't hear it. We don't have control of that down here. Uh oh. Wait a minute, we're going to play it again. Sorry. Um, oh, we don't have the. No, just. Oh yeah, because you can't hear it. Um, okay, it's working now. Put it up. Okay. Supported housing is premised on a resident's wishes. Those who do transition out of the institutions are promised enough support to live on their own. But our reporting has found more than two dozen cases of people struggling or failing outright. All underscore the complexity of identifying the right people for the program and managing severe mental illness with home visits. How long were you in your own apartment? Maybe three months, I'm not sure. When did the help stop coming? I would say like two months ago. Yeah. How did it go when you moved back? I cried. I don't want to struggle no more. Once an apartment is secured, the move is immediate. There is no gradual transition. I mean, basically they said that I was going to get a roommate, but I'm supposed to know what this person is like from a five minute meeting. For some, the new freedom can be too much. Some wind up on the street, some go back to the adult homes. People feel that when they leave, they get the apartment and they say, I'm cured, I have an apartment. God knows what they're going to do. Unchecked, a person can become endangered by their own circumstance. For Abraham Clemente, things went well at first. And then he started to refuse care. So Abraham, how's, how long have you been here for? I don't know. You don't for know? Eternity. For eternity? I don't know. I see people move in, people move out. It looks like you might have a, an infection of some kind in your finger there. Oh, because I hit myself with a surgical hammer. And I banged it and it showed up. And then it started bleeding pus and everything. When was that? A couple of months back. It's been like that for a couple of months? <coughs> yeah. It takes, it's going to take a little time to heal because I'm a diabetic. What's that? That's dog shit. The dog walked in here and took a shit there. Do you feel like you need somebody to help you? No. I interfere. I do it myself. I live in this building, but I'm scared. Um, he put a chicken in the oven, and he totally forgot about the chicken, and it was a lot of smoke. I live in the third floor, you know? I'm lucky I got a fire escape. He need a lot of help. He, he really do. A lot of people feel like, who are we to say, you are not well enough, you shouldn't be living on your own. Who are we to infringe on somebody's freedom? Other people say, well, that's just a cop-out. Are you giving me my right to fail? Or are you letting me cling to my right to be free to such an extent that it's going to be the death of me? And we need to um, show people um, with hopefulness and stuff. Um, you guys tackled here, you tackled uh, people who are very ill. How do you, but, but, you, but uh, and, I, and I was lucky enough, uh, I know that this, the film, and I know that your story that was in the Times and ProPublica does 
do that. It does preserve the dignity, but it's a very high wire act to write about people who are so extremely ill and to show them as three-dimensional people and not just victims or not just people to be frightened of. And, and um, uh, Dr. Friedman talked earlier today about when you're walking down the street, if you see somebody in a psychotic episode or a businessman who's drunk, it's the drunk businessman who's the greater risk. How do you guys, how did you approach this? Um, first of all, why did you tackle the story and how do you approach it by preserving the dignity of Abraham and Nestor and the very ill folks that you spent so much time with? Yeah, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, first, I just want to give a little bit of context to what everybody just saw. Um, the, uh, the what, what we have been focusing on for about a year and a half now uh, is this transition that's going on here in New York City under a federal court order that has required um, the state to move out people with serious mental illness who live in what are called adult homes uh, into their own uh, supported housing apartments. And uh, this, I should say, is, is all a consequence, really, of Cliff Levy's reporting 15 years ago in which he exposed these horrendous conditions inside these group homes that are scattered on the outskirts of the city. And so uh, we really felt uh, that it was important to look at the alternative that was proposed and, and whether it met um, the promise that was offered to these people who were moving into this very ambitious program. Uh, people like Abraham and some of the others that you saw in that clip had spent many, many years living in uh, these very regimented environments uh, where there was very little psychiatric care, but they became dependent on what services were in place and this very rigid structure that was in place in these, pla in, in these facilities. People did not have to do their laundry. They did not have to cook for themselves. They did not have to use public transportation. Their lives were really confined to these uh, buildings. And so uh, it is an extremely difficult thing, as you can imagine, to transition from that into an independent living situation. And uh, we wanted to see what that was like for people. And certainly there's a number of folks who are really thriving, uh, but we, we also found a lot of people who were struggling in, uh, in really devastating ways, like Abraham. Uh, and so to get to, to, to your question in terms of how to handle the sensitivity of this, um, well, first, we actually consulted you uh, early on, and, and we found those conversations to be really encouraging because your sense was that no matter how compromised these folks were, they, they deserved the chance to tell their own story. And so um, we took heart in that. And, and we had a lot of conversations throughout about uh, consent and whether people were in a state in which they could, um, you know, sort of coherently give their consent. And uh, those conversations changed depending on the circumstances and the characteristics of the, of the individual we were talking about. Um, and then what we did also was uh, to go out and, and do reporting and go and get um, a lot of extensive documentation on the conditions that these people were living in through their own uh, social service and, and health records, um, as well as talking to other sources, whether they were social workers or therapists or counselors or, as you saw, a neighbor who could kind of speak to the experience of the people who could sometimes be unreliable narrators of their own life. Um, so I'd say that's that's how we approached that. Yeah, and and you do you you are very clear about that about you know how uh, s not 
they cannot always be reliable. We none of us can really always be reliable reliable narrators on our own, of our own lives, and so you do have to go to people around us, family members, <coughs> friends, neighbors. Um, Tom, can you talk about the filming because these images are searing, and I mean I probably seen that clip maybe like 10 times, but it gets to me every time. Um, as a, f as a uh, filmmaker, what special challenges did you have capturing these images? <coughs> um, well, I think it's just, uh, I mean, I love the, well, Kit's gone, but I love Kit's story. Maybe she'll hear me in the stratosphere. But I, I think that the, the, the experience that she had going to that intervention was, it speaks to me as uh, a documentary journalist um, because I think it's the power of immediacy. And that's what I always try to find uh, when I'm on in a film and doing a story. And working with Joaquin, uh, it was, uh, very collaborative process of going and finding sources, getting access, and then just me pushing very, very hard to get there at that moment, at any moment, getting into people's lives. And then there's an element, kind of a temporal element of how much time can we spend with a person. Uh, this scene is after about a month of working with Abraham, I think. Um, and, uh, and then it goes beyond that in the film, in the full film. So the amount of time that you spend before you get the camera out is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, establishing a relationship, uh, establishing consent, uh, establishing uh, parameters that he would have, uh, and getting a level of comfort that uh, he might that he actually didn't have with many, if any, other people. Yeah. It's a matter of that, just establishing trust. Yeah, and we, we talked about this a lot uh, as you guys were putting this together about, um, it, so this is not a happy film to watch and it's, it's, it's in many ways very disturbing, but it's also so important. And did you f feel that, uh, so Joaquin, you talked about um, you know, the importance of getting people's voices heard all along th the way. Um, that 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 was worth it. Uh, do you, the, again, the degree of difficulty that you guys had to execute to tell this story, uh, and and um, it's not a cat video, <laughs> you know. I mean, it, it, how do you, are you glad that you did this story, and why is it important? Um, well, absolutely. Uh, I'm, gl I'm glad that we did it. And uh, the most rewarding part of it uh, for me was the day that we published uh, in the Times, the, the judge called for an immediate examination of the services that people were getting in supported housing mm -hmm. and, uh, and the way in which government is overseeing those services and, and the incidents that take place among people who um, t make this bold leap to live on their own, and, and that's really why we do this work. So um, impact, impact. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, that was absolutely worth it. The film is, you know, will come out on February 26th, and we'll see how it's received. But yeah. uh, but I, th I, th I think it's going to deliver a really powerful yeah. message the same way that the print stories did. Well, it's very important work, and thank you so much for talking to us about it. So now we're going to move to Mark, and Mark is going to talk about uh, his work and his ideas on how journalists and how we can tell our stories in good context. Yeah, right? Yeah. So, uh, thanks, Meg. And uh, like sure. I'm yep. an AV specialist. Uh -huh. Great. Always use your help. Great. All right. Thank you. So, um, as Meg mentioned, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm also an epidemiologist. So, we've been hearing about individual narratives. And um, in my world, I work. Uh, can we hear? You hear? It, so it, as I said, we've been hearing about some compelling individual stories and individual narratives. And I'm an epidemiologist, and so the world that I work in and think about has to do with broad patterns. And um, so it's, I'm asking you to sort of frame shift a bit. Um, but I wanted to um, begin with a quote from a great uh, and famous Supreme Court justice from the last uh, Gilded Age. Louis Brandeis, who once um, famously wrote, the publicity is justly, 
recommended as a remedy for social and industrial diseases, and sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. And I chose this because I think it's, there's a character and an element to it that is relevant for investigative journalism. That is, and it's sort of that, that Meg gave you, or gave us a capsule summary of, and we've seen illustrations of this idea that there are salutary effects from digging in and uncovering hidden harms that are buried in everyday occurrences and practices and patterns and, and policies. And so, and in, in a sense, that's part of the mission of, of journalism. And so I thought I would take a few minutes to, uh, to share with you um, some reflections on how well I think our journalists are doing on a few of those areas related to uh, marijuana and its relationship to opioids. So I thought I'd show you, I don't know how well this shows up, but you can see uh, that we're, over the last decade here in the United States, we've undergone a real change in use of marijuana. The, the rates of, it, of people, when you ask adults, have you, have you smoked marijuana in the last month, the percentage you say yes has doubled over a relatively short period of time. And um, underneath that, uh, or behind that, we've had also very substantial changes in attitudes, public attitudes about marijuana. The, these data don't go quite as far, but they're nationally representative, so they tell us about the nation. They tell us that, you know, at least as of 2014, half of adults thought that marijuana, using smoking marijuana was harmless. Well, I can tell you as a psychiatrist that that's not true. Uh, and that we've known for a long time that uh, regular heavy use of marijuana is related. Uh, it puts you at increased risk for a variety of harms. Automobile accidents, emergency department visits, uh, vulnerable individuals, there's an association with psychotic symptoms and so forth. So you would think that this disjunction between public attitudes and what we know from medical research that there would be an area for a journalist to shine some sunlight on. Um, but if you thought that, uh, you'd be wrong. Um, you can see here that the proportion of stories, in that have, and these are stories that appear in um, major print media, so they don't capture the internet, where I know a lot of people get their news, uh, that leave positive impressions of marijuana has tracked pretty well with public opinion. So it's an example of where, in my view anyway, there's been a lost opportunity, or we haven't, journalists haven't done such a good job of, uh, of shining light and using sunshine as a disinfectant, as uh, Justice Brandeis um, uh, in his theme. And I thought I would dig on this theme a little more deeply into um, an idea that's gained circulation in the last couple of years, and it's an idea that is, has its um, origin in some studies, what are called ecologic studies, that have been done looking at, at a state level at rates at, of, of, of outcomes related to opioids in relationship to medical marijuana laws. And so I'll zero in on, on one particular article that appeared back in 2017. And so this is a little wonky, but bear with me. Uh, it's done by a health economist at the University of California, San Diego, and sh her name is Yu Yong Shi, and what she did uh, is uh, she looked at the proportion of hospitalizations that are related to these three different kinds of uh, behavioral disorders in relationship to whether the states have medical marijuana laws. So if I can focus your attention on the middle panel. And so here what you see in the solid line are the proportion of hospitalizations for opioid use our opioid dependence and abuse, what we now call opioid use disorder, the proportion of hospitalizations in states where they have medical marijuana laws, and you see in the dotted lines the proportion of those hospitalizations for opioid use disorder in states that don't have medical marijuana laws. Well, if you look at this, you can see that you have, first of all, you have higher rates in those states with medical marijuana laws, but also that they're increasing at a faster rate. So that if you were looking at this, this is directly from a paper, that's what you might conclude. Well, she didn't stop there. She did um, some uh, very technical transformations of the data using a series of regression techniques where you control for various variables. And I won't take you through it because it's, it's rather arcane. But when you do that, you can sort of, 
what happens is the relationships flip. And so also, if you dig deep into the article, you'll see that over this 18-year period she's studying, that the, that the probability or likelihood of having these hospitalizations for the opioid use disorder is actually in the model, not in reality, in the model that adjusts for all these things you see in fine print, it's actually um, it was, uh, lower in the states that had medical marijuana. So this came out in March of 2017, and then it, I can say that it's not one of the more high-profile um, journals, but nonetheless, if you were to look at the headlines uh, that day or the next few days, uh, led by the Rolling Stone, no, no, no surprise, in, in reporting on this paper, their lead was how medical marijuana could help end the opioid epidemic. And of course, it bears no relationship to what's, what's in the um, article itself. And you know, NBC and CNN and Reuters, they picked up on the story as well, and a little bit, their leads were a little more temperate, but <laughs> they kept the same basic gist. And uh, the journal, though, took a pass, and they found some other <laughs> pressingly important news to tell us about on that day. So, so my, my, my point is, we've heard, um, I think, some wonderful examples of investigative journalism and digging into how systems have failed individuals and uh, shining uh, the light, uh, the sunshine that, that uh, Justice Brandeis had in mind when he talked about it, having the, the ability to heal or to disinfect. But uh, this is exceptional stuff, and there's a lot of journalism out there that is really just flowing with the currents of what they think readers want to hear and what they expect to hear. And so that's, that's really uh, the point that I wanted to make in my brief presentation this afternoon, and to urge you to really dig in if you're reporting on articles, if that's the kind of work that you do, to dig into them, ask, try to understand them as best as you can, ask tough questions, be skeptical. It's very tempting to write sensationalistic and exaggerating headlines, but um, the, the, I think that the trick is to maintain the interest of your readers at, by being um, honest about what the research actually shows, showing an awareness of um, the fact that in mental health science as well as in health science generally, things usually progress sort of incrementally, oftentimes things that we think are true are subsequently overturned. And also to try to avoid what's called the confirmation bias. And this is, uh, the idea behind the confirmation bias is that we all of us have a tendency to sort of select from the environment things that affirm or confirm our pre-existing ideas and to sort of resist that and look with fresh eyes on the, if you are the sort of a, a doing mental health science reporting, bring fresh eyes to bear on the work itself. And for that, I, um, a quote I thought I'd leave you with from Pascal from a long time ago. He's a, a famous French um, philosopher, a mathematician, a theologian. He, he wrote in his Art of Persuasion that people almost invariably arrive at their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. And so we need to, we need to fight against that tendency. So That's you. wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think we have time for a few questions. Hi, I'm Gina. I'm a writer and a teacher. And Mark's, Dr. Olfson's point brings up a question I've had for a while looking at headlines versus studies. And um, I know that Malcolm Gladwell wrote a New Yorker piece recently about medical marijuana and how it might not be as safe as is suggested. And there was a lot of criticism about that. Um, and I'm wondering if the criticism comes from that place of uh, the like pro, how, how popular CBD is and how the public opinion has changed. Um, in the same vein, talking about marijuana, um, Marie Claire also did a piece on women using psychedelic drugs to heal from depression. Um, and it was popular in the same way that the Rolling Stone piece might have been popular. So on the one hand, we talk about things being popular. And it was interesting to hear Kit talk about um, the quality of comments 
on her stories. So the quality of comments and reader engagement seemed to improve with the quality of her storytelling, um, especially in reaction to the woman that she wrote about. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to get at that reader quality <laughs> and reader interest, which has been achieved um, by journalists like Kit Steele, um, but also get at that scientific um, and nuanced evidence. Um, and what's I'm your, not sure exactly question? what that takes. So my question is like, how do you do that? We've seen some examples of it. We're all here with that desire to produce that thoughtful, accurate, but also well-received work. And so what has to come together for that to happen? Um, and I'm not sure that we're, I'm not sure that we are meeting the challenges, like the editorial logistics and the things. So that we just leave it there. That what? How do we? How do we do that? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> how, just, like if? How do we avoid some of those headlines? What are some, based on that study? What What do we do instead? If you think about how those stories are constructed, thank in you. newsrooms. Well, you know, I'm not a journalist, so I'm not sure I'm the best qualified to answer that question. I think it is, it, it, but you've distilled it down to, I think, what is the nub of the challenge, and which is how to, how to keep things interesting. Um, you know, journalists, after all, are interested in things that move and change in the environment. And uh, yet a lot of this stuff is sort of stationary or moving very slowly. And um, so I think some of that has to do with the, the art of how well it's written. Uh, and also, I think keeping in mind, you know, there's some issues like the issue of cannabis. I mentioned it's so closely tied in with people's ideas about what legislation should be, and and people's thoughts about their um, libertarian rights of what we should or shouldn't be able to do, and the whole issues of around legality. And it's very hard to write about the science of it, you know. Um, and and I so I think separating those things out for, in that example is is helpful, and and so being clear and how the work is constructed, what aspects of this thing that you're actually trying to understand may be of some help. But it's, a, it's a, quite a challenge. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is Barbara Ritchie, and I'm on the board of directors at the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And I would like to thank Jacqueline for building on the work of Cliff Levy and reporting on the difficulties of transitioning from group homes into um, you know, scattered site apartments. And you you did do, you did balance out the reporting saying that the vast majority of people are able to successfully live on their own. And um, I'll just make a comment in a room full of writers that might be <laughs> heretical, but uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And you know, I'm looking forward to seeing your film and I hope that you are showing some people that are doing well and thriving in supported housing. Um, you didn't have those pictures in the article. That angel food cake was pretty horrific, amongst other things. But thank you for unearthing the challenges there. Not really a question, just a thanks. Thank One more. Hi. Yeah. Um, OK, so this is my thing is directed at you. Um, so I've taken lots of neuroscience classes. I study neuroscience. I had a professor last semester say, you can Whatever hypothesis you have about the legalization of marijuana, like medical or otherwise, yep. you can find a study to support you either way, right? And in my personal research, I found that to be true. And I've also found it to be true when you're reading, like, when you read, like, the actual scientific literature, right? No matter how deep into it you go, and no matter how many cross-references you do, you're going to find things that say, like, marijuana, like, people get, like, driving accidents, people will get in less driving accidents when marijuana is legalized. And then you'll find, like, the exact opposite to be true. Um, and I also wanted to point out that as recently as January 4th, the New York Times did publish a piece called What Advocates of Legalizing Pot Don't Want You to Know Because Alex Burson is Writing the yeah. Book and Everything. Yep. But my, my question no is not, it's more of just like a, um, I don't think that the problem is necessarily like one field or the other, but it's like in the communication of the fields. And I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts on how fields could better communicate with each other. Because the research itself is confusing. So how can you report on something if conflicting research exists? Well, I think that's, you know, the, if we really properly understand the research, it doesn't conflict. It may, in a political sense, it may lead you on to, to different um, arguments politically, but 
you know, unless the, the, there's something wrong with how the, the work was done, and, and even that you could report on, I suppose, if we really dug into it. I mean, nature itself doesn't have these inconsistencies, right? Which isn't to say that there, are, there aren't, there doesn't exist evidence to support competing theories. And so bringing that, bringing that discussion and making that in a way that the public can understand and, and think about, to me, that's a very useful, um, that's a very useful function. That's a great service. Uh, because very few people dig into these journals. Most of them, most people would find them boring, you know, or if they, to the extent that they could understand them. So, so digesting them and breaking them down, building some of the tension that you describe, all of that's helpful. I mean, it doesn't, it won't be satisfying in the sense that it, uh, it resolves um, if people are looking for simple solutions. But the, the reality here is incompletely understood, and it's a complex one. Clearly, um, you know, we live with a lot of substances, with alcohol, with tobacco, that we know have harms, and they've been, you know, been made part of our broader society. So that's a separate issue having to do with values uh, than, than where the science, um, uh, where the science can tell us. But the science should inform those discussions, and that may be a job that, you know, that a skilled journalist can take on. Well, I want to thank the panel because this was a, a tough discussion about tough stories, but very important stories, and thank you very much. <laughs>